Welcome to Journey Through Sci-Fi. My name is Matt. And my name is James. This week on our AI series, we are looking at Robots in Love. We've got a couple of films of robots catching feelings. Yes, in uh, very interesting ways in some some instances. Very different ways as well. So the first one is from 2015 and it's called Uncanny. Uh, Although we both watched it under the name Android, didn't we? It's had a few different name changes throughout Uh, its release, I think. Speaking of weird names, we're looking at Zoe which is spelled Zoe <laughs> from 2018. <laughs> but it's got like a little thing on the E, hasn't it? Yeah, so obviously as uh, two well worldy <laughs> men, we should know exactly what that means. Um, yeah, Zoe from 2018, directed by Drake Doramus, and uh, Uncanny is directed by Matthew Lutweiler. Lutweiler. I'm glad you said that because I would have massacred <laughs> that name, as I tend to do on this podcast. I might have massacred it. I just did it with confidence. That's the, that's joke. the thing. As long yeah. as you've got confidence when you say it, then that's the best way to do it. Um, so, shall we get into it? Let's start with Uncanny slash Android. What did you think of Adam? <sighs> He's amazing. I can actually see him thinking. His movements are naturalistic and precise. It's as if there's intelligence behind it. Do you think she's pretty? Yes, I do. What do you think? I think she's very pretty. So you just said it, it went through a few name changes. What else is well, it known by? I only know it had one other name uh, initially. It was also released with the title Almost Human. Oh, was it? Okay. Yes. Um, but the case for the film, apparently, in the 2016 version had uncanny as the name i think that's the real name yeah i think it's uncanny because it makes sense and i prefer that as a name it's more interesting than android interestingly um the machine that we talked about a couple of episodes ago yeah uh that was also known as android i think in some territories yeah ah interesting it's a boring name yeah why (laughs) give it just a generic name yeah yeah, I felt like Uncanny was a really good name for this film. Yeah, Uncanny is a much better name, and they, I think they mention, they refer to it being Uncanny at some point, don't they? Yeah, they, talk they about do the Uncanny say. Valley. Yeah. So, shall we start by talking about the Uncanny Valley first? Because this is something which I didn't really know too much about until yep. seeing this, and I was like, what are they talking about? So I looked it up. I felt like I should have looked it up a lot sooner in this podcast, because it's it's quite a big thing in sort of um, looking at AI. Yeah. But wh- how much do you know about that sort of thing? I only know, uh, my understanding of the Uncanny Valley comes from video games mostly. So yeah. you, see it, you see it more and more as video games have just got increasingly better graphics over the last 20, 30 years. Um, but they always look a little bit weird and they never look human. Uh, and they describe that as the Uncanny Valley and it's the closer something gets to being photo realistically human but is still not a photo basically uh it's got that weirdness to it and that kind of the graph that you could chart of similarity you know to a human there's Mm. a a drop-off point where it becomes very close to looking realistic but becomes quite creepy and weird yeah it's a really weird phenomenon isn't it yeah and that's the uncanny valley yeah, so I did like I did my uh, usual podcast research and right. had a little look on Wikipedia. What have you turned up? Um, so the uh, so the YouTube videos which I saw tell me that um, Masahiro Mori, um, he was a famous roboticist, and he coined the phrase in 1970. So he was sort of making all these robots, and he started finding that the more human they looked, the better people were responding to them initially. So he kept doing that, and then he kept making them more realistic. He started doing things like adding like fake skin to them, all those kind of things. And then as he started doing that, he found that there was a weird sort of cutoff point where people were looking at them, and because they weren't fully human and weren't sort of like um, fully distinguishable, uh, people were freaked out by them. So I think that's like a really interesting thing with looking at AI if you if you sort of don't get it quite right if it's not fully human or if it just looks nearly human it's kind of like the weird differentiation you need to have between the two it's your it's your brain catching on to something being not quite right yeah and being very alarmed by that 
That's it. And it's sort of like, it, it does freak you out because we've seen in a few of these um, films, uh, the stylized robots, you kind of, you can accept that more because they, the st- you can either go stylization or you can go photo real, sort of like realism. That's how they do it in sort of CGI terms. Yeah. Oh yeah. Have a, have an actor playing uh, a robot or yeah. have a, you know, prosthetic or a physically metal made robotic structure. Yeah, you've just got to have, it's just when you get to that weird in-betweeny bit. And um, what pe- what a lot of people refer to is, um, do you remember Final Fantasy Spirits Within? Yeah. Yeah. So I quite liked that film when it came out. I can't remember a damn thing about it. It absolutely bombed. Yeah. And I think the reason that it bombed, well, the, the reason most people say it was because um, the CGI in it is trying to be really photorealistic. Yeah, and it was an early early wave of that photo yeah it was like one of the first instances of it when they're really trying to sort of like do this photorealism cgi and weren't they uh before it came out weren't they really hyping up the main character to be like the first digital actress or something like that she was gonna they were gonna sell her rendering or whatever to other studios that's it they were trying all these things with that film but it just freaked people out (laughs) and interestingly at the same time in 2001 um shrek came out (laughs) <laughs> and uh yeah shrek and final fantasy very interlinked yeah. um but they had the same problem so when shrek was originally released to test audiences apparently uh the character fiona was more photorealistic oh really and it freaked the kids out <laughs> so they had to make her more stylized <laughs> in order to sort of like resonate with the audience to go to a more sort of disney archetypal princess yeah. type of look right? and like it's when you think about video games and stuff like that like you've already mentioned like something like super mario and then compare that to something like call of duty yeah so i think that, that that's a real strength of what nintendo does is that they don't always focus on uh photorealistic graphics and they've never had like the, the most powerful processors and consoles and stuff on the market they focus more on the gameplay have quite cartoony graphics in their flagship games and, and people still absolutely love it and it doesn't look like call of duty or halo or whatever but yeah. it still it works yeah exactly and i think it's the you think about games which you don't quite you know the graphics are a bit shit but the reason you think they're a bit shit is because that they've got this like halfway point between photorealistic and stylized yeah and what you'll be is overly critical of a tiny tiny error so Yeah, you can be playing something like Call of Duty and you should be completely blown away by how incredible these these scenes that you're seeing are. Mm. But then like you see one character's eye doesn't quite look like he's looking at the other character correctly. And it's all you can focus on. You really zero in on that error. Yeah. And that's all part of that uncanny valley, isn't it? And again, it's the eyes. The I think the eyes are the the main giveaways for any of these sort of things. Yeah. Um, But yeah, so that leads us on to Uncanny. And I think it's very important to have that premise in your head about the Uncanny Valley, especially with this. Um, So uh, what did you think of this film first off? Um, I thought it was good. Yeah, I thought it was all right. (laughs) Like it was like it was it was good. It had its moments. Um, For me, it kind of missed a beat somewhere. I don't know what it was. Maybe I just wasn't as engaged as I. The ending really happens all of a sudden. Yeah. Uh, yeah and that, i thought you would say that because it's kind of like the upgrade twist ending yeah i, yeah. I quite liked it yeah it but it worked. was really like really sudden yeah uh, and then it was a completely different yeah. storyline we'll, we'll get to the ending though because yeah. um a few things we need to go through first with the film um but it's again it's like another low budget film um independent release i think it got trapped in post-production for a long time so it does have a lot of similarities to ex machina obviously yeah, yeah. And um, the film we're going to be talking about later on has a lot of um, uh, similarities to her. Yeah, this one's closer to Ex Machina than yeah, that is to it's her. it's very yeah. sort of Ex Machina. It's um, three main characters. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. One of them is introduced as a AI robot. The other one in this one is a journalist. That's not what happens in Ex Machina, but it's basically a, it's a very open Turing test, isn't it? Yeah. But it's a Turing test in both of those films where... Uh, so the traditional Turing test is that you talk to a machine and you're unsure if it's a machine or a human. Mm. In these films, they are told it is a machine and we want to see if you think it's a human from from talking to it. Yeah. Um, 
what I found interesting with the similarities to Ex Machina. So when did this come out? It came out the same year, didn't it? Um, so yeah, it came out in 2015. On the on the IMDb trivia page for this, there's only yeah. like three or four points. Yeah, I spotted this. And one of them was um, the script was actually written three years before Ex Machina. And it's just like, who's put that? Who's gone on and put that? On? No one mentioned Ex Machina. The fact yeah. that you have to go on and say, actually, the script was written three years before, yeah. just goes to show that like people people must have been pointing out when it came out. Also, imagine having this film, which is it's it's quite clever, but then having this film and then having another film, which is basically this like similar premise, just blow it out the water. Right. Sure. But then it it makes you wonder when the script for ex machina would have been written because mm. the point whoever wrote that trivia point possibly someone who worked on the film <laughs> <laughs> the point they're trying to make is oh we didn't rip it off you know it's an original idea and I, I get that that's totally fair um but there's a good chance that the script for ex machina was not written in 2014 it yeah. would have been written a few years before and it been in development but this happens quite a lot doesn't it it's to do with the the studios kind of wrangling over getting the release out isn't it mm. so if uh, whatever studio that made this got wind that another studio was making a film called Ex Machina, you know, they heard the press releases or they heard a bit of buzz or whatever, they then go to their filing cabinet or they send a send a run around and be like, what what scripts have we got, you know, what got ownership of about an android meeting a person going through a Turing test? Because I've just heard that yeah. this film's coming out, Ex Machina, it's going to be big. We need to get something out on Let's the same Let's get thing. ours out. And it's like when they release... Um the like lower budget versions of films which have similar names to something popular that's come out yeah like a mockbuster yeah so i think this is a more earnest attempt than that yeah this isn't it's not a rip-off it is it's two writers who were I, I fully believe working completely independently had very similar ideas followed it through roughly similar logical steps and came up with roughly similar plot lines it, you know it's all purely coincidence if anyone hears done anything dodgy it's a studio head who's tried to cash in on on another studio's work yeah exactly and it feels like unfortunate that's going to sort of happen to this film because like i said before it is like it's it's an enjoyable watch and i feel like they were trying to do a lot with it yeah given like the independent budget so it's a very small cast just three people there's like one other person rain wilson's just like (laughs) just a tiny bit you do see him in like the opening scene yeah uh and then they keep mentioning his character. He's called Castle, I think, isn't he? Yeah. He's the sort of benefactor of the the research that's going on. We see him watching them through like security cameras and stuff, don't we? So there's a definite sort of pulling the strings puppet master. Yeah, kind of someone's vibe. sort of like orchestrating this. So there's um, so the three characters are there's um, David uh, Cresson, who is the um, scientist. There is Joy Andrews, who is the uh, investigative journalist with a um, degree in robotics as well as a sideline thing. Yeah. And then there's Adam Cresson, who is the android. Yeah. Yeah. And then obviously Castle. So having such a small cast, did that make the film seem more intense to you? Because it, it's, it's quite a thriller, isn't it? Yeah, it's a good setup. Yeah, there's lots of sort of stuff going on. You don't know who to trust. It's very claustrophobic and it really, it builds up the tension really nicely, which is mm. kind of the reason this film works is that it's really small scale, very tense uh, and quite simple, I guess, yeah. in what they're trying to do with the plot. She shows up as a journalist. She's been given this uh, exclusive access to... David, isn't it, David? Mm, yeah. Um, because he's this just amazing, super genius, uh, boy wonder, ridiculous stuff, like graduated from probably, I don't know, MIT Harvard or, or MIT, something, yeah, like, something that. like that. They always say MIT, uh, yeah, don't they? at 19. Um, just sort of ludicrously intelligent guy. But she doesn't understand why she's there. She's been given this exclusive access, but mm. uh, she thinks it's a bit of a waste of time because he's just showing her like a robotic arm yeah or or robotic like a, eye. yeah it just goes around his like tool shop yeah to tool shed whatever it is and then uh he introduces her to adam mm-hmm. um who is this slightly strange guy yeah uh who she thinks is his what cousin with asperger's or something that's yeah because that's what that that's like the go-to for her because he seems like he seems very sort of withdrawn a little yeah. bit yeah and he said and he introduced himself with the surname crescent yeah uh so it establishes that kind of familial relationship between them um but pretty much straight away there's no there's no beating around the bush is there 
David tells her that Adam is actually the end result of all the research, all the mechanical eyes, mechanical arms. It's all it's all about him. Yeah. Um, he's this uh, new form of life that he's built, and that's why she's there to yeah, learn about that. Find out and then put it in her article. Like, that's what we assume anyway. Yeah, why do they want the... What's the reason for the publicity? Is um, there a reason? Not there's sure. not... I don't think they really define it, but we all assume it's just... You just sort of like take it for granted. It's just that she's doing some sort of news report, news report on it because she's a journalist. That's why she's there. And things sort of like just progressively get more weird with her relationship with this, um, the character of Adam. So I don't know when we should reveal the twist because it's quite confusing talking about this film. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it, It's a film with a, a massive twist at the end and it's yeah. kind of the whole point of the movie. Yeah. So we, we need to, we do need to talk about it. And I, you know, if you haven't seen it and have an interest in seeing it, this is kind of the crux of the movie, but it, it happens in like five minutes. It felt like the big reveal is that David is no, <laughs> David so, is not David. Adam is David. Yes. I think it was unnecessary to have him uh, use the same name because that got really confusing <laughs> in the end. But the, the character that we've assumed is a, is an AI robot for the whole film. We've been told is an AI robot, uh, is the real David Cresson, the computer genius. Yes. The, the David that she's been falling in love with throughout the film uh, is actually the AI that he's created. Yeah, so it's like a double bluff. Yeah. But yeah, so he's saying to her, I can't believe you think that he's real um, when he first introduces Adam, who turns out to be the real creator. Hmm. Yeah. So, such a confusing twist and such a confusing way of talking about things. Um, but the main thing is you think the creator is the robot it turns out it's the other way around yeah what i found a bit strange about it was that um the uh the character that we think to be the creator scientist throughout the bulk of the movie is incredibly weird yeah. throughout the whole film and i was gearing myself up for a twist where it turns out they're both robots created by castle that's this, what i was thinking yeah because he's he's so robotic and he's really struggling with emotions and the plot of the film is that he both uh david and adam whichever way you want to look at mm. it both of those characters are, are falling in love with joy the yeah. reporter throughout the film and she chooses the one that she thinks is a human and she's actually a bit freaked out by the advances of the the robot yeah she's like acts properly disgusted when yeah. the android when the robot is coming after her but a big problem i had with that was that it wasn't particularly convincing that she was falling in love with uh david mm. because he was also very strange robotic just a, had a really weird way of expressing his emotions yeah because they both feel strange. they're both very socially inept aren't they they're yeah. not sort of like particularly likable characters when it comes down to it because there is this thing that um really like highly intelligent people sometimes struggle with sort of like social situations um because obviously they're thinking about a thousand other things with their sort of like epic minds um so i think that kind of comes across with this because you can't tell who's the robot and who's not because they both seem as robotic as each other yeah i think that's deliberate isn't it yeah. feels like that was deliberate the problem it gave me was I just, I just couldn't understand why this girl was just falling head over heels in love with this complete weirdo. Yeah, he just seems like a bit of a douche as well. Yeah, yeah he's a real asshole. Yeah. He comes off like um, quite pretentious at the start. Yeah. And he sort of like um, like belittles her a little bit. It feels like that, even if he doesn't directly do it. Yeah, and she has a phone call with her friend, doesn't she? Where she's like, oh, I've got to put up with uh, David Kessel um, lording his intelligence over me. I can't remember how she phrases it, yeah. but being patronising or something like that. So she's she's clocked it she knows it mm. that he's arrogant and condescending and aloof and yet over the course of a week i think yeah the film it's just takes place. a week and you're constantly reminded of that because it's like day one day yeah. two and she completely falls in love with him yeah <laughs> it just doesn't work at all it's very strange it is very strange do you think she's pretty her hair is nice good facial symmetry delicate features nice fashion sense yes i do i think she's pretty what do you think? I think she's very pretty. Well, that's good to know. You have impeccable taste. They constantly refer to her robotics background as well. Mm. Because this is part of the thing as well. They're trying to fool her 
into falling in love with the robot it turns out yeah um, yeah she's a she's an unwitting so i said at the start that the, the basic concept is she's she knows she's in a turing test and that is how it seems for most of the mm. film the twist is that she's been in uh an unwitting turing test yeah and it's been flipped and she was unaware of it and she's the the turing test has been passed by the robot because she fell in love with it she fell for it she thought it was a real human that's it and sort of like the way david or as it turns out adam talks about robotics is interesting as well because the way they're talking about it is kind of like an artistry yeah he's obsessed with the the artistry of robotics yeah so i think that was quite a nice idea because you never in any in the films we've watched so far they don't really talk about so much about the technology in these kind of terms but he's very much talking about how he wants it to be more believable these ais and he he's he doesn't look at it as like a competition because in a lot of these films it's the creator robot it becomes a menace it outthinks us and it becomes like more than us he wants to create something that is sort of like living alongside us mm. and that's kind of what he does in the end and it's this it's this weird sort of like idea which we definitely really come across too much before yeah, I think it's the first one, first AI character we've seen that's that's born out of artistry, form over function. Mm. Every other robot has had a preset of rules and it works within those rules. Um, or it's reprogrammed or, or it goes wrong or something like that uh, to become more human, mm. get struck by lightning, whatever. Yeah, this is a, This is a robot that the creator has supposedly, and I don't, I don't know if this turns out to be true or not, it's a bit hard to follow, but mm. um, has supposedly just been created for the sole purpose of looking like a human um, and therefore being beyond the uncanny valley, I guess. Yeah, that so it's like sense. making that full-on realistic thing which you can't differentiate. Yeah. That's the whole thing that he's trying to do, isn't it? It does some interesting things and they, they have some interesting concepts like they're building a working stomach for him, aren't they? Yeah. Uh, he doesn't need to drink he doesn't need to eat it's simply for the for the pure artistry of having this uh, working stomach inside him i think i think we saw that in bicentennial man didn't we because he uh he creates all the organs which are used as artificial organs and save lives in medicine but he's doing it for himself to have like working human insides yeah that's probably the closest um instance where we've seen that haven't we yeah but he wasn't built for that purpose he um he evolves beyond it and then wants to do it to himself. Yeah, because in Bicentennial Man, the um, point is he's trying, yeah, like he's trying to do it himself because he wants to become human with the Pinocchio problem kind of issue. Hmm. Whereas this is a creator who wants to create another sort of version as close as he can to a human, but it's not quite because it's all artificial. Yeah. And he talks about sort of like the movements of it as well. It's all sort of like the little nuances that make it more believable well he he makes a point of saying that he's trying to make a machine um that's going to live alongside humans without the need to compete yeah so all previous ai and machines have been built with the only frame of reference being can they be better than a human at this task mm. and then when they're doing that they cut to um adam doing the ping pong which yeah. i thought was quite clever well it's just a spit on the nose but it was like he's doing that and he's really good at ping pong <laughs> well it prefer... turns out to be the human anyway yeah i preferred the ping pong to the chess yeah there's lots of chess in i'm this. a bit bored of chess <laughs> being used as a shorthand for like this unique human intelligence it's very war games isn't it yeah i think we've seen it in others haven't we i could, <laughs> do, with sure that. I could do with no more no more chess references in the and ai then series when he's talking about the chess uh it's kind of like the different strategies that they use to get the girl and that kind yeah, of thing yeah and um he 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 sacrifices he sacrifices the game he sacrifices his king in one game so that he can take the queen yeah uh the point being he's changed his priorities we think he's a robot at this point uh, and he's just picking which which one he wants to do he's like i'm playing a different game to what you're playing yeah it, it does creepy stuff like that and so who we think is adam at the start is really creepy and it feels like that kind of uncanny valley thing because you're you like he looks human but you you're told he's not human yeah so everything he does seems more shady yeah so it's kind of like if it was a human, 
then you just be like, oh, he's just a creepy human. But it's I got that extra layer to it where so he does stuff like he looks at porn on the display, doesn't mm. he, at one point. And it looks like he's trying to learn about sex. But in the end, it turns out he's just a creepy guy. And I don't know which is the more disturbing idea that this robot is just learning. Yeah, because he was doing that on his own, wasn't he? So if he was... The, with the twist in mind that, that was the thing about the twist happening so quickly yeah the film had ended and i was still trying to deal with well ha- now hang on wait a minute <laughs> so he was the robot all along and he was the real human what does that mean and yeah now you're mentioning that he that obviously when you think that character's a robot and he's looking up porn because yeah. he's met this woman and he's got these feelings um he, he doesn't understand how it all fits together properly yeah. that that makes sense but why would <laughs> david <laughs> The oh, no. human in in his just on his own i guess he just wanted to look up porn yeah he's just very strange isn't he <laughs> yeah. he's just a strange guy yeah he's definitely a weirdo yeah, yeah. and there's this whole thing with the robot penis <laughs> why am i always bringing up robot penises on this podcast <laughs> no, but i remember it this time yeah. and i don't think you're crazy for <laughs> oh my god but yeah so what is going on with that so, like, so she sleeps with uh david the yeah. person she thinks is david the scientist yeah. they develop this relationship and they sleep together uh and then we find out he's a robot and the real david who is not a robot yeah uh has her tied up and has the real robot kind of on the slab and he gets out this like prosthetic thing yeah. doesn't he and he's like that's your boyfriend's dick <laughs> yeah but there's like there's a bit before that as well so you know when he's um so he's just looked at the porn Oh, and then they're right, in the okay. they're in the um sort of like workshop or wherever it is. Right. And he's making something on his own. And I, I think he's making the robot penis. Oh, is it? Okay. And right. he's sort of like um looking all shady about it. And he puts it <laughs> underneath some paper or something like that to get it out the way. And she's like, Oh, what are you working on? And he's like, Oh, it's nothing. And I initially think no thinking that he's the robot at that point, that he's making himself a robot penis. Do you see it? It looks like a dick. It's like long and oh, okay. yeah, oh, I miss phallic that. shaped. Always miss the penis. I'm not. I'm never paying attention. Why am you, I always looking? Got, <laughs> got a laser eye for the robot penis. I'm, I'm like. just always looking for the sordid bits. <laughs> yeah. in all of these films. So that that works. I, I had to be honest. I completely missed that bit. So yeah. that makes sense. So what was really happening was the real David could see that there was a romantic relationship building. Mm. So he had to very quickly cobble together a <laughs> cobble robotic together. dick. <laughs> a robotic dick. Yeah. So that Adam, the robot, yeah. who is secretly a robot, can have sex with her yeah. and continue the so Turing like, test. Is he playing? Um, he's, he's not really after her in that way then. Or is it? Does he have feelings for or is he playing the character? Because it's quite hard to define, isn't who, it? Which one? <laughs> so, <laughs> so the, the one who turns out to be a robot. The one who turns out to be no real. The one who turns out to be real. No, I don't think so, but because he does I don't things quite like know. so he gives her an old robot eye which he made. And he's like, Oh, this is one of my old eyes, or something like that made. And you yeah, it's weird. Yeah. And he says, You can use it as a paperweight. She does use it as a paperweight, and he uses it to perv on her. Mm. Like with his weird CCTV hookup. Yeah. Yeah. There's something creepy going on there. Uh the, <laughs> the end scene the end scene where he talks something creepy. <laughs> when he talks to his boss at the end, it kind of suggests that he didn't have any feelings for her. Yeah. Right? Because it was always the plan. The, so the twist goes one step further. He was really the robot. I'm the real guy. They let her go, I think, don't mm-hmm. they? Um with an NDA and they're gonna bring down her paper if uh, whoever she works for if it ever becomes public knowledge and then he's talking to rain wilson his boss and it's what it's all kind of a, a military exercise yeah because that's the next sort of step isn't yeah it? so so it's a, trying to create like an infiltrator yeah i guess something so convincing we can sell it to the department of defense or the army or whatever mm. and he was always on in on it because this is like the next big step for his career if he can do all of this and convince someone. So I don't know, maybe he was a bit conflicted and a bit of jealousy, but ultimately he was always out for one thing, which is just to fool her, yeah. get this amazing job. So I wonder if you would get that on a repeat viewing. Yeah. If you could sit for the whole thing again and with all the twists. I could sit through it again. Yeah. I think it does sort of, it does warrant that. Um, the, you know, the, the pacing being what it is, it kind of hits you like a brick at the end. But yeah. to watch it again and see how those 
how those interactions are happening and all those little looks that we interpret as the robot developing feelings is that actually the human getting jealous of a robot you know yeah because like it's a weird creator creation relationship as well isn't it yeah because like they because the way that the real creator is acting he acts like a like a kid doesn't he he like plays up to it and he's sort of like they have like a fight and things like that and he has like little tantrums he has a massive tantrum Mm. at the end he has a complete explosion which at the time we think is oh my god the robot's got all these emotions and it's gone completely haywire because he says um something like uh oh you're afraid of me and he's like surprised that they're afraid and it's almost like as if it was a robot at that point that the robot suddenly realizes it has more power than Mm. you would know but then also there's another bit so so let's see if i can get which character it is so the real creator the real david grabs joy's knee at one point and grabs it really hard and then she freaks out like oh that really hurt Mm. How strong is this guy? Because <laughs> it's implied that he's like a robot at that point and he's really strong and he could have broken her. Yeah, so that's what just a deliberate bit of acting on his part to try and sell the idea that he's yeah. a robot to her. So he just grabbed it as hard oh, as really humanly hard. possible. But yeah. you would look you would look like, you know, your hand would be all gnarled up to to grab someone's leg. Yeah. Up. I don't know. It's little bits like that, yeah. which I don't know if they're but they it works at the time until you find out the crazy twist. Do you feel like David is a bit of an incel? Which David? <laughs> the um, the real David. Yeah, he's got that kind of a vibe. Doesn't yeah, because he? yeah. he's he's really creepy. And he's they both like... do, to be honest. The other David, when you think he's the real David for most yeah. of the movie, has got that kind of shunning society. I'm smarter than everyone else. It's it's less menacing, and it's kind of like he's bitter that he can't get this girl as well. The real one, yeah, 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 at the end. That's like classic incel. Yeah, there is a bit of that. This is this film was pre that culture. Well, I yeah. don't know. It's it been around for Probably, a long time, yeah. hasn't it? But before it was a really mainstream thing. Because I think that's definitely part of his character. Yeah, he's he's misogynistic. Yeah, um, he's got some resentment towards this woman who he's been tricking um, for a week. We're looking at robots in love for this particular episodes do you feel like the the robot is in love at all in this yeah it's it's tricky isn't it because uh, because you kind of like get into their relationship at certain points they have like the weird bit on the um top of the rooftop they're looking out and it's kind of like she puts her head on his shoulder and it's, it's it seems a bit weird that scene turns out to have some significance doesn't it because uh there's something about the castle guy, the benefactor guy, is a little bit angry that that he allowed the robot to go outside of the the network area yeah. or something. Yeah, and but, then they fix that later on, don't they? Because he can't leave. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's mm. how we find out that he was a robot all along. Is that they try and escape when they're under attack, and something goes off in his brain and he just collapses. Yeah. Um. No, I think. Uh, so uh, the thing is, you know, we wanted to talk about robots in love, and I was watching this film, and I had a suspicion that he might turn out to be a robot. Yeah. But I didn't think it'd be a complete switcheroo. So I was kind of watching it from the perspective of the one we think is the robot for most of the film. Is is he falling in love and developing feelings? Yeah. I think actually, yeah, the one that turns out to be a robot was in love because he didn't know he was a robot. Yeah, and he's properly into that relationship, isn't he, by the end? And as far as we know, the um, the... The parameters of the Turing test. Well, so if you're if you're talking about him building the the penis halfway through, <laughs> then it was never planned that they would fall in love and might have sex in that week. Yeah. If he's got to build that halfway through the week, the the parameters of the Turing test didn't involve falling in love and mm. developing a romantic relationship. So I think, yeah, you've got to give it that bit of faith that that's a natural thing that yeah. developed. And looking at look, looking at it in terms of the uncanny valley joy is completely invested in that relationship yeah she is like in love with that guy yeah the robot is really like fallen for him it's passed the turing test with flying colors Mm. she thought it was a human yeah did you see the post credits scene no there's a post credit scene (laughs) what (laughs) happened um we see joy in her like apartment Mm. 
uh, she's very upset. She takes a pregnancy test and yeah. then she gives it the old, I'm um, looking at it and she reacts. Oh that's no. The, that's the twist. What? So extra twist post credits. Extra robot baby. Yeah. So that doesn't make any sense, does it? Oh my but, God. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, reminding me of seeds. Demon Seed. Yeah. I mean, robot penises, it's Demon Seed. Yeah. And if everything's all about the artistry and they've built stomachs and everything, I guess the implication is they've built sperm. I guess. Wow. That just adds a whole other layer. Yeah. And that's probably why it's a post credit scene because... Yeah, who, bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> Should we move on to Zoe slash Zoe? Yeah, sounds like a plan. One of the most important things in our experience as humans is connection. The idea that you're safe, that it's going to last. Companions are not going to leave you is important to me. The mission comes up with the probability of two people staying together. Your chances for a successful relationship are 75%. Congratulations. So, I have to show you something. In a very real way, we're teaching him how to feel. So this is a lot more kind of light. It's lighter. Much lighter. <laughs> and this is what I thought after watching Uncanny, and then I watched this, and I was like... This is a completely different kind of sci-fi film. Yeah. And again, like we, like I said, I like that sci-fi can be so many different things. So we've gone from like crazy dark thriller to something a little bit lighter. It's basically a um, sort of like romantic drama, this, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, I'd say that. It's a yeah. romantic More drama. More on topic for robots in love. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's called Zoe, and I think we should call it Zoe. Mm. I didn't realise the character was called Zoe until fully i don't know two-thirds of the way into the movie yeah when she's she's kind of running around everywhere and interacting with loads of people and every character was calling her zoe and characters <laughs> who'd never met her were calling her zoe because yeah. previously i thought that was an affectionate name uh, i thought they were calling her zoe for short makes sense uh <laughs> but then yeah she's meeting characters that she's never met before and they're like are you zoe and like i suddenly clocked like oh that's that's the name <laughs> it's not <Yeah>. zoe <laughs> um that is never points out in the film it's very strange uh but, but then i enough. suppose if we if we'd read the title with the e and the what's it called but it's an english language movie like i don't want to get like, <laughs> i just want to sound like a, you know it's an maybe, english language you know? movie James. <laughs> so. it's fair it's fair i could like in the last episode when we were talking about this i said zoe straight off the bat yeah of course you'd assume so and i've got it yeah. written down as zoe in my notes so that's, that's it but yeah so we've got over the title conundrum. right yeah, yeah too many title conundrums in this episode so, so yeah, so it's a love story um, at the forefront and we've got a very different robot creator relationship in this, haven't we? So yeah. the creator is played by Ewan McGregor and then Zoe, within 25 minutes of the film, we find out that Zoe is a robot. Yeah. She's a synthetic. Yeah, that that's... I mean, that's pretty obvious from the trailer, isn't it? Yeah. Like, I'm just I knew if that you was hadn't on watched the, the trailer. <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of like you get that from the from the bit. Yeah, because the trailer's really interesting. We watched the trailer a few weeks ago mm. um, in preparation for this, and we we talked about it at the time. The trailer is uh, this is a like you said, it's a romantic drama, and as such, the the people who've edited the trailer have edited it exactly how you would edit a romantic drama film mm. trailer, which is to say that. They, every plot point of the movie is in a two and a half minute trailer. It's in there. Beat by beat. There's no teasing out the plot. You you know the exact story of this film if you watch the trailer. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it's that makes it very clear that she's she's not a human character. Um, but the start of the film doesn't doesn't give you that up front, does mm. it? And yeah, and this film is all about relationships, really. It's very sort of like heavily focused on that and sort of like um like romantic relationships and all that kind of stuff. And I think that the director has done quite a lot of films with those kind of tones. Oh, is he? But he's just done the sci-fi twist on this one. Yeah. So they work for a um, like high-tech, near-future dating agency, basically, don't they? Yeah. Um, and there's, there's quite a lot of ideas at play in this film, kind of spun out from that sci-fi dating agency mm. core concept, isn't there? So we need to talk about their kind of, business model in this dating mm. agency their primary product is called the machine is that right is that fair to say yeah and that's a good kind of black mirror-y concept mm. it's uh you, you go in and it's it's seems to work exactly the same as real world 
uh, dating websites, there's a long questionnaire. Uh, you answer all these questions. Um, if you're single, it matches you up to someone on their database yep. and you get like, it's all about this percentage match thing. Yeah. If it's high, the machine's never wrong. You're going to live happily ever after. If it's low, break up with them. Doesn't not going to work. So if you're single, you get matched to someone, but they also have couples coming in. It's like a kind of couples therapy thing. Mm. Which seems really like dodgy as a couples therapy if you get a terrible match after that. Basically, yeah, that was what it was. They just get them in and if you're not a match, they would encourage you to break up. Yeah. And if it was a match, then what your relationship problems are fixed, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's the concept. So it's all about the percentages, isn't it, in yeah. this film? Yeah. Beyond that, and I don't know if maybe there are a few too many sci-fi concepts, but I really like them all. Yeah. Um, they've got two sort of new emerging super products, haven't they? Mm. Which is the synthetics that are going to be your perfect companion. Yep. And there's a drug. I love the drug. The drug's really good, yeah. The, the idea behind the drug is that you um, basically you, you find a partner you take the drug with they can be a complete stranger or it can be your wife of 50 years whatever mm. and you take the drug together and it uh simulates the experience of falling in love for the first time yeah. with with someone which is like a, it's a crazy sci-fi concept it's a great but, concept I and think. how did they not think that this was something that would become like addictive yeah and it's not going to be used in the way <laughs> that they imagine well it is used in the way that they imagine i think but i think the idea is that it was not intended to be available on the street. Ah, uh, yeah. So you have a scene later on where there's like a drug den, a party kind of thing, and everyone's mm. just using it with strangers. I th I think I got the impression the idea was you would come into their office with your partner. It's a controlled environment. Uh, you take the drug and you have a lovely time and you pay yeah. and you leave. Because the first time they do it, they've got like a um, couple, sort of like an older couple, yeah. sort of like in their 70s or something like that. Yeah. And then they're having, they're taking the drug and they're sort of experiencing what it was like when they first got together. Yeah, and they're like dancing to sort yeah. of. Yeah. So all of those concepts are kind of happening at once at the same time while the plot's happening. Yeah. Uh, Ewan McGregor is the chief, uh, chief scientist on specifically on the synthetic side. Yeah. Think, right. So you've got these other arms of the business, and he's not involved in it. Um. But weirdly, it starts with the creation of another robot, doesn't it? Yes. So in the um, sort of like opening bit, he's creating a robot called Ash. Who's the handsomest man <laughs> in the world. <laughs> what right? a guy. Yeah, so that's uh, he's played by Theo James, who's also in Divergent. Okay. You probably haven't watched because it's not very good. <laughs> um, but yeah, so he's in that. And he's like teen heartthrob kind of. Yeah, yeah, he's ridiculously good looking bloke, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, he and the whole point is that they're creating him to be this perfect partner. Yeah. But also he's a bit of a sales rep for the synthetic brand line, yeah. isn't he? Because he they go to like an expo and he's introducing the concept of a synthetic romantic partner uh and trying to sell it and saying how great it would be and then he goes and what if i told you that was me <laughs> and now all, all and the ladies the, the ladies in the crowd are like, oh. fanning themselves yeah um, uh, yeah it's but yeah he's he's the he's the face of that brand isn't yeah it? and it's important looking at the other synthetics you see at the beginning they don't look very human they all look deliberately synthetic like there's ones which are cutting the hedge oh yeah, and yeah things yeah. like that we don't that. see a lot of them yeah in the rest of the movie like, do we they're like about Again, it's, I think, because there's so many concepts in this film, they don't... Yeah. But it is... You get that hint that we're living in a world where very simple robots do some basic tasks yeah. for humanity. But so, so this company, they're focusing on relationships and human relationships and sort of what they can do. And that's quite important given Ewan McGregor's character because he's a divorced guy. He's quite lonely, isn't he? Mm. And there's, um, there's one bit when he's visiting his ex-wife... And he's got this, there's this weird mannequin, which breathes. Yeah. Yeah. And he's like, he ends up taking that back with him. And he made it to um, give to people which are going through like a divorce or something like that. So they've got something to sleep with, mm. which simulates sort of like, like another person. Yeah. Which is quite a creepy idea as well. Yeah. Kind of, it did freak me out. And it like, it's just like a, it's just a mannequin that breathes and it's similar body temperature or something. Like yeah, that. yeah. Yeah. And it yeah. lies next to you in bed and you can forget that your bed's not, you know, hasn't got your ex partner yeah. in it. Yeah. You've got like this weird mannequin in your bed. Yeah. <laughs> and then to kind of complicate that emotional relationship, uh, he's still 
he's got a kid with his ex-wife so he's still in touch with her and he sees yeah. her a lot i didn't realize that was his ex-wife when she's introduced because mm. they have a very good relationship it seems I yeah it they're like they're something. very friendly aren't yeah. they um but he's not coping with the divorce as well as she is she's actually moved on she's got a new partner yeah uh because he says oh i can stay around yeah and she's like no because he kind of jokes about the dummy mannequin doesn't yeah. he and then she says no i've got someone coming over and then he gets <laughs> he a bit huffy but she wants she wants to put it in an art project yeah. doesn't she? and he's like yeah sure whatever and then when she says she's got someone coming around he gets a bit sulky and he says no don't don't put it in your art i'm yeah. gonna take that with me actually and sort of like there's moments with him which are like um you see zoe as well at the same time so there's bits when he's looking in his fridge and there's not much in there. And then you see her looking at her fridge and there's not, not much in there. Yeah, classic romantic yeah, matching like, up. Oh, I wonder editing. what they're doing kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah. And they're both sort of like living these sort of similarly lonely lives at that point. Yeah. And then they make it explicit that she goes into the machine. Uh, she's never done the machine test. Yeah. Uh, despite working for the company, which is a bit of a red flag. Mm, yeah. And we realise later why that is. Uh, and she gets a 0% match for Cole. And Ewan that's McGregor's like not possible is what they, they say kind of thing. She thinks it's not possible yeah. because she's got feelings for him. Mm. Um, but then, so this dating machine, it really reminded me of the sort of like Turing test kind of thing. And specifically Blade Runner. Yeah, no, I thought that. It reminded me more of the Voight Kampf test. Yeah. Because it, it, I think it even asked a question about a turtle or a tortoise, didn't uh, it? It's, it was something like... Um, if your dog had its front legs removed, yeah. would you kill it or would you or would would you kill it or would you have its front legs removed or something like that? Something specifically about an animal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like the the Voigtkampf test showing empathy for non-human creatures. Yeah. Um, and she couldn't answer it. Yeah. But it was a very human response in that she didn't know which was the best answer because it's such a tough question. Yeah. And then she ultimately said, I don't know. What I think I there was like a euthanasia question or something like that. Yeah. Well, that's yeah, and then she, if you if she's got protocols in her, then she wouldn't be able to do that anyway. And when they're developing Ash, uh, he's also talking about trying to teach Ash real emotions through the physical experience of emotions. Yeah. So like making the AI smile, and then you work back from the, work backwards from there. Yeah, and he gives them emotional packets, doesn't he? Yeah. Like memories, which, like, are from other people which give them that extra layer to make them more human. Yeah, like socialising Ash, I think, is the term that they use, mm. isn't it? Because they, they're teaching him how to dance. He wants to dance with Zoe. Uh, and it's kind of it's kind of built up at that point in the film that maybe Ash is going to be a romantic partner for Zoe. Yeah, because that seems like the logical thing, because they're both synthetic. They well, I think even together. even before the reveal that sh that she's a synthetic, yeah, yeah, he's giving her sort of longing glances. I think Zoe even asks, "Is he for me? Have you built him for me?" Yeah, or possibly vice versa. I can't remember, but that that possible relationship is the, what it seems to be build, building up to. Weirdly, Ash gets sidelined throughout yeah. the rest of the film, doesn't he? He's not built for that purpose. He's a spokesman for the company. He's a product. That's it. Although he's made to be, yeah, he's made to be the spokesperson, but he's still unique because they say something later on where they talk about Zoe and Ash and Ash says something like, we weren't built, built for commercialization specifically, those right, yeah. two. Yeah. Although, prototype. Well, yeah, she's they were a like, prototype. They were prototypes, basically. Yeah. So it's, again, you've got that kind of, um, we're so used to seeing AI and robotic, like robots being used in a commercial way in all these films that we've looked at so far these are sort of like prototypes they're early they're they've got that uniqueness the uniqueness aspect which sort of is such a fundamental thing to making something more human-like because yeah. humans are all unique in their own way and it there's a a good link here to uncanny which is the idea of that artistry of the robotics mm. So there is something to these two characters, Ash and Zoe, which isn't, like you said, it's not for that commercial end. There is a sort of higher level concept of artistry to, to their creation. Definitely. So um, the relationship with um, Zoe and Cole, did you believe that relationship by the end of it? And why does it go wrong in the middle part of the film? So, yeah, they he has to reveal to her that she's a synthetic. Yeah. And she takes it really badly. It's quite cruel because he kind of takes her home and says, there's no food in your fridge. Have you never wondered about that? 
you're a synthetic. I, and she's like, why didn't you tell me? He's like, yeah. I don't know, I just want to see how, <laughs> just how long it, see goes. How yeah. it goes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a bit of a cruel experiment they've done on her. But they do, um, once they're past that point and the, the secret's kind of out, they mm. do develop a, bit, a, a natural relationship. Yeah, they find out they've got quite a lot in common and things yeah. like that. And they go on all your cute little romantic film dates yeah, and all it's that. It's very cutesy, isn't it? Yeah. Like they go on the university campus and they're laughing and mucking about and Yeah, they go to a really they go to this um room where the whole wall lights up and it lights up based on what you're saying. Yeah. Your vocalizations. Um and it's, you know, looks amazing, amazing visuals, very romantic and then it's just, it's just a bit it's a bit over the top to be yeah. honest, the whole scene they then kiss and it's like fireworks which doesn't make any sense because we've just been told the it's, sound? yeah there's no sound um, just really loud lip smacking uh, <laughs> 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 they put that over the top of it that'd be amazing actually what a scene that would be um yeah they they have this pretty believable relationship uh until one night they're out together and she gets hit by a car mm. and then the relationship immediately breaks down and it was a bit confusing just in the way it's played out on screen yeah. so the the idea was what that he uh because he had to he saved her life he took her back to the lab you know mended her mm. but what there was is it that uncanny valley again where once he was had that experience of being reminded of what she actually is it turned his stomach a little bit and he was stuck uh, yeah. in that uncanny valley i think it must have been because at first i was a little bit confused because they specifically say she's worried about being reset or having her brain turned off mm. whilst he does this procedure. And I thought maybe she's going to lose her memory, which she doesn't in the end. She's still got all of her memories intact. But yeah, I think it is that uncanny valley element because he's having to go in and fix her. And then he's looking at her more like a machine again, as opposed to this love interest, which he has. Because again, he created her, which is the, the sort of like like funny thing. Like a father-daughter relationship yeah. should be there, yeah. But he's got this, like, romantic relationship with her. And, yeah, after he's done that, after he's sort of, like, been rooting around in her bits <laughs> 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 and uh, connecting all the wires back up, um, then that's that sort of, like, yeah, freaked him out. But that's not explained, for It's explained through dialogue, I think, yeah. isn't it? Which it, it, it didn't come across very clearly. Yeah. I think about ten minutes later, a character says, oh, so your relationship fell apart. Mm. because of the accident and it's like okay yeah i guess if you're telling me that then i'll, I'll yeah i guess that's what happened and they both become really withdrawn at that point mm. because um so so said something to him like um I've, I've moved on really quickly i think it must just be something in the way you designed me going back to the design element and that sounds a bit sort of cutting like it's your fault this is sort of like is where it is in our relationship so what happens after that then what happens after the relationship breakdown so when they um when the relationship breaks down they both sort of go their separate ways um cole leaves the company and then they both find themselves uh taking this drug and does he take it as well she goes yeah. she goes off and she's desperately trying to find some romantic connection with anybody yeah and she goes to a bar and then some guy instantly finds her tries to pick her up um, they go off to this weird, like, crazy brothel place. Mm. There's quite a few different brothels. No, they this. go to, like, more like a crack den, yeah, isn't it? But they've got, like there a, is a, a robo brothel. It's like, a, it's like a nice crack den, though, isn't <laughs> yeah. it? It's yeah, like it's up my, it's kind of, yeah, it's a bit middle class. Yeah. yeah. Middle class drug party. Yeah, so they go um, there and then she gets wrapped up in this world of people taking this drug to simulate these kind of emotions for that yeah. relationship. So she's pairing up with many many different people to try and mm. to try and get that feeling back is he doing it as well then i can't remember yeah because um he sees her doing that or something and then he goes off um sits on a park bench they're both sitting at the same park bench i feel or it's at like different times yeah, yeah so they're both doing the same thing and they're just trying to escape their feelings through multiple partners yeah and just to forget sort of like the feelings that they had for each other which again, it's like, like it's it's that romantic element of this film. They've done it with a sci-fi twist, but it's it's something which sometimes happens in relationships. They're trying to get over someone. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. You see similar montages in other films. Yeah, with the assumption that they're gonna, the romantic couple will always come back together at the end and and fall back in love. Yeah, which is kind of what we're expecting to happen at the end of this film, mm. and it does. Yeah. Um, 
So she ends up going off to the brothel as well. We, we just mentioned the brothel. There is mm. a, a robotic brothel. They're not... Uh, Cole's company is not the only company making uh, synthetic romantic partners. Yeah. There's a sort of seedy underbelly of um, a, a brothel where you can go and there's robotic partners for you there. Uh, and they all look very lifelike as well. Don't yeah, they? I thought that that was another really interesting concept mm. and it, it fit nicely into this into this universe. Again, possibly too much going on in the concepts, but it's like they've come up with every sci-fi thing you can do around the idea of dating, sex and romance and put a sci-fi twist on every facet. Just of that. put it all together in yeah. an hour of 45 film. Just like um, smacked it all together. And crucially, the main person the main robot in that brothel the 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 favorite one that all the clients want to see is played by christina aguilera yeah blew my mind when the credits started playing because i didn't recognize her at all it's really weird isn't it when you see like the fifth name in the cast is christina aguilera i was just like as who where was she she playing a voice or something (laughs) (laughs) because she's like unrecognizable really yeah completely yeah um yeah so she plays a character called jules who Mm -hmm. is like the lead um sex robot in this brothel yeah, but she's also um, kind of on the way out a little bit. They've got a finite uh, life span. Yeah, they say like, um, and then they get repurposed. And they, the way they get repurposed, they're not quite, they don't go into detail about it, but it sounds Strip really shady. Yeah, Got the impression. Killed. Yeah, yeah. Is that how the accident happens? Is that the same time? She sees Jules, who's now been kicked out of the brothel, yeah. goes over to speak to her. And gets hit by a car. Yeah, because yeah. Jules is sort of like begging for help because she hasn't got a job anymore. Yeah. Although she does go back to work at the place, doesn't she? Does she? Because later on, um, Zoe has that moment where she's, yeah, going to get... Yeah, but that's, yeah, she's able to go back there because doesn't Zoe help her out? Doesn't she tell her to come to the lab and Zoe uh, and Ash? Ah, yes. So there's all this sort of underworld of the the robots are doing their own thing and helping each other out and creating their own society a little bit and that's it and it's sort of like the the different ways that we're seeing these robots treated is interesting because you've got this brothel where they're just used for sex and then you've got this romantic relationship which is happening with zoe and cole sort of like on the other side of that yeah but zoe and ash being these special kind of prototypes they seem to have their they seem to have a, a, a bit of their own autonomy. Mm. Zoe doesn't know she's a robot at first, and then she ends up off the back of that falling into this genuine relationship. Ash makes that point to her, doesn't he? You, you were lucky because you didn't know. I always knew. Yeah. Um, and Ash becomes this quite sad, tragic figure by the end because he's got no purpose. He can never... He wants a partner, I think. I think he asks mm. for like a, a bride of Frankenstein type partner off yeah. coal and... That doesn't really pan out, and then he just asks to be switched off. Yeah, and then the worst, because the worst thing for him is what happens sort of like towards the end of the film is Zoe's model is commercialized, and they start making loads of robots which look like Zoe, have her memories, um, have all those kind of parts of her, yet they're made to be mass-produced, so they've all sort of like follow a set sort of parameter. Yeah. And then for Ash to see the girl that he was sort of like had was falling for everywhere mm. same face everywhere can't escape it that must have been mad for him and mm. they kind of gloss over that but yeah again, i think that's kind of a, like a bit of a rough treatment yeah. by the film like i said gets a bit sidelined and then yeah. Poor has Ash. a really sad ending where he just requests to be powered down yeah and turned off and then he makes a point saying that zoe will never get powered down because She's, she's more likely to end up in a museum though, that's yeah. what he says. which isn't you know that's not very comforting the way yeah. he says that like you're so special you're the prototype you're going to be your model's going to be this world changing uh product so they're probably going to stick you in a museum for, for the rest of time which is a horrible grim thought yeah. that he's had at the end of his life so there's a bit of a um they have a bit of a pinocchio moment don't they when they're during their relationship mm. Um, I can't remember why she's upset. Oh, she's having trouble with her memories. They go to the university and she's she's having trouble reconciling these these real memories that she's got and she's yeah. not sure if she's real. Um, bit ghosts in the Shelley, bit AI. Mm. And she gets very upset looking outside and having a memory and then realising that it's not her memory. Yeah. And then she can't cry. Uh, and that's another cruel thing. 
um, where Cole's kind of apologising, like we didn't really think this would happen. You've evolved, and yeah, we never you've built got you any all these feelings ducks. now. So, yeah. but that's the important point that he's making there is that the the film is making the argument that uh, they're programmed with real genuine memories that come from real people and then are repurposed in a generic way for the robot mm. to sort of map onto their brain naturally. Uh, and the argument is that if you've got that real memory of a real motion, emotional experience, that is equal to a real emotional experience. Yeah. So the, the value of the memory of something emotional is as much as the actual emotion itself. That's kind of the case that they're making for, yeah. for how real these characters are, isn't it? And that's sort of like what you base all your relationships on. It's like memories of things and sort of like that's how you build these connections because you remember things you did with people and sort of like it all sort of like spirals off from there, doesn't it? That's how they're kind of making the case for for this being a real genuine human relationship mm. that they're, they're finding themselves in. And do you feel like you believe that relationship as well, the sort of Cole-Zo relationship? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think so. Because um, you do get drawn into it. I know there was half, uh, there was a moment halfway in the film um when they were going to the cabin and they were doing all this like silly stuff and it was like um i felt like i was really like invested in them at that point yeah it's a well directed romantic film yeah and i can totally believe when when you said before that the guy who directed this has done who's got you know he's got a cv for for romantic films because yeah. it it's a convincing relationship. They're very, uh, and you've got to give it to Leia, they do, and Ewan McGregor, mm. very naturalistic performances. Yeah. Scenes, particularly from Ewan McGregor, seemed a bit ad-libbed in a sort of nice, romantic-y boyfriend-girlfriend way. There some, yeah, there were moments when I was really like, they're just having a normal conversation and making yeah. each other laugh. So yeah. it's coming across that way. Yeah, so it, good performances from them, good directing from someone who knows how to make a couple look realistic on screen mm. um the the main thing for me was that whole father daughter creator creation relationship yeah that basically the the film was constantly having to work hard to get past that mm. because that is we've seen it in a lot of films um and it's not just because we've seen it in a lot of films it is because that's natural for, for this ai frankenstein relationship yeah. isn't it the there's a sense of creating something that that gives you the responsibility of being that thing's parent right mm. and it's very hard to move past that when those characters are then trying to enter into a romantic relationship so one of the things that i think the machine did so well was it kind of took ownership of how weird that is yeah and it played around with the fact that it would be weird for those characters to be in a relationship this film doesn't do that it just works very hard to convince you that the characters are in love they're not father and daughter they are equals in a romantic pair yeah so they're they're doing extra legwork there on the romance side of it and that's done through the reactions of other characters as well isn't it because yeah. the ex-wife um says i've never seen you so happy yeah he kind of gets the thumbs up from the from the ex-wife i'm happy for you yeah and and she doesn't look at it like um oh zoe's synthetic she's not real yeah she's just like zoe is what you need yeah and that's kind of what he's making. He's making companions for people so they're sort of less lonely because he's, I, I think he says, um, humans will leave you or they'll let you down or something like yeah. that. And it's it's quite a bleak out. Very bleak. Yeah. yeah. So he's saying the only way around it is if we make our perfect partners, which is pretty disturbing when yeah. you think about it. Yeah. We and talked it's, about... It's very um, sad. We talked about the idea of slavery a little bit, that if yeah. you're your goal is to create something that's uh, as clever or cleverer than you mm. and then you force it to behave in a certain way, that's, you know, you're putting that thing into slavery. Yeah. There is that kind of element to, to that line of thinking that he's got as a designer, isn't it? And they're going for empathy as opposed to any, like any of these other advancements like intelligence or anything like that. They want to create robots which are more, that feel more empathy for other people than we sometimes do. So they're less selfish. They're really thinking about all these other humans. And I thought that was like a nice, interesting aspect. Yeah. But it seemed like uh, by the end of the film, Zoe was the only one that, and maybe Ash a little bit, were the only ones that could really do that properly. Because I think we go back into the Uncanny, of, uncanny Valley a little bit mm. when we're introduced to the mass-produced Zoes. 
And certainly, so they become this like just overnight worldwide success. They're in every home or whatever, you mm. know, like very successful, incredible product that has all the empathy that, that we've seen in Zoe throughout the film. But Cole goes to see one of them who's living in Zoe's mm. flat and he's totally freaked out by her, isn't he? Yeah. So there's this. He would be because he's yeah. like in love with this robot and suddenly there's another one which is exactly the same yeah you talk like her you look like her you've got all her memories but but inherently i know you're not her that's Mm. the uncanny valley isn't it yeah so so what's the what's the disconnect that's happened there between zoe the 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 perfect prototype and this mass-produced version that's fell back into the uncanny valley is it the fact that it's mass-produced and that becomes inherently inhuman to see a room full of 20 women who all look identical that would be creepy. Yeah, I think that's it. Because even identical twins, you can tell the difference. Yeah, because there are like there's certain uniquenesses about everyone. Everyone's slightly different, slightly like blemishes somewhere. Something's not completely perfect, and that's what makes humans what they are. Yeah. Whereas if you're putting a load of like things which all look the same, and that's that is wrong our brains think that's wrong because it shouldn't be like that yeah two things being completely identical is creepy identical twins aren't creepy because they like you said they have differences they behave differently yeah they are two individual humans uh if you did meet identical twins who behaved identically and were like the same person that would be uncanny valley creepy yeah that's the unnaturalness is that they have no sort of unique distinguishing features Mm. Um, that's a whole other separate thing. For, that's when, you you know, lots of sci-fi films have dealt with that with clones and mirroring and doubles and replacements and stuff, which is a completely different level of uh, quote-unquote identical to, to just seeing some twins in real life, which is, you know, just a normal thing. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's the uncanny valley territory, isn't yeah. it? Um, but the thing with the crying comes back later, doesn't it? Yeah. So let's talk about the way the film ends because um, it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> terrible was in you were very sad or terrible was in it was stupid, really bad <laughs> um, is it, this is a good film i like this yeah. film and i would recommend it but if you're the sort of person who needs a really good ending to a film to feel satisfied yeah. this isn't it because she dies for some reason or she's dying yeah she tries to get her brain wiped yeah that's it but it's a sort of delayed reaction sort yeah. of thing it takes so many hours days yeah. whatever but she's started that process Christina Aguilera comes around. Um, <laughs> what a sentence. <laughs> uh, Ash is there and maybe some other people, I can't remember. Yeah. And Cole is running through the streets, classic romantic film ending, gotta find her, gotta find her. And then he finds her and he comes into the apartment where she's dying. And uh, what happens? Like she just sort of magically comes back to yeah, life. Yeah, she has like a love. flashback because she didn't actually get her brain wiped. Oh, didn't she? She was oh, just yeah, about yeah. to and then she remembered their relationship and sort of like the happy moments they shared. That's it. She goes to the brothel and the yeah. madam of the brothel is actually like a, a scientist like Cole who yeah. builds all of those prostitute robots. But the thing that really wound me up was she cries, doesn't yeah. she? And yeah. we've had this explicit thing where it's like she doesn't have tear ducts and it's like Pinocchio is a real boy at the end. But, but how, like you've set up this world which is like, it's very clear in the way that it works, yet you're going against that by just having... Uh, magically cry at the yeah end. yeah it was like the power of love she's she's a real yeah girl but that's not i found that really stupid I yeah get on board with that. that did annoy me as well um and yeah it's, it's kind of like they'd say to set it up with like she can't cry but you don't need to have it at the end it's just <laughs> no like the just... pregnancy test at the end of it <laughs> <laughs> yeah so these films are doing well until the end when they do these this extra extra weird level of shit yeah i know what you see and none of it is ever going to be real. I see somebody that I hurt. And somebody that I lost. Somebody that I love. And I know, I know now, this is what I want. And I know it's not going to be, like, easy or simple or, or without complication. It's real. You're real. More real than anything that's ever happened. But yeah, other than that, I did enjoy this film. Really good film. I've yeah. never seen some of these um, sci-fi meets dating concepts. Yeah. I think 
like I said, maybe too many of them in one film makes it it's too busy with the concepts. Yeah, it's very but busy. The the drug, the synthetic romantic partners, the dating machine. I like the fact that they're all they're all quite realistic. Yeah. And the main sort of message of this film is they want it's like empathy and relationships and human relationships specifically because all these things are there to try and develop these things aren't they yeah to bring people closer together so in both of these films in uncanny and so do you do you believe that these are selling the idea of robots and ais capable of falling in love i think zo is goes along that way i still think there's something inherently weird about it when you're creating your partner yeah yeah, yeah it's it, there's something which is a little bit strange if they're like the unique aspect of it makes it easier for me to understand in terms of the films because if you've got unique robots which are all different because that's part of the reason people match up is because everybody's different and then yeah. you find sort of but that's not the end product is it it's a mass-produced line of identical zones you yeah. wouldn't have your own tailor-made one but yeah but i think the point in the movie is that don't they move away from the Ash model of a unique partner Mm. and actually Zoe's ability to have perfect empathy is actually to work in tandem with the drug, isn't it? She's, she's a robot that will facilitate your enjoyment of the drug because she's so good at feeling empathy with you. Yeah. You can, you, they're selling you the robot and the drug together, aren't they? That's the kind of. Yeah. Cause that's another important thing because Zoe takes the drug, but she, it doesn't have an effect on her. Yeah. Which we didn't really mention, but the people Yeah, the that... implication being that she, because she has because she's really in love with Cole, I guess. Yeah. Or because she's a robot, I'm not sure. It's like she both. doesn't need the drug. She just likes the way that because she sees more in the empathy side of things. Yeah. She likes the way that these other people are reacting to her because of the drug. Yeah. Ridley Scott executive produced this. What? Yeah. Really? You weren't paying attention to the credits, were you? Christina Aguilera, Ridley Scott, names popping up at the end. I mean, that's a mental combination. Yeah. (laughs) I wonder how much they've worked together. (laughs) I wonder how much Ridley Scott was involved in this. You know, when you see executive producer and it's it's a massive name like that. Yeah. You do wonder, well, he wasn't on set every day, was he? Yeah. Probably, I don't know. I don't know a lot about how the industry works, but it's that more when... um, you know, you send Ridley Scott a script and he says, this is great. This is really interesting. I'll give you some money. There you go. Yeah. I'm exec. Yeah. Yeah. Is it more along those lines? I don't know if an executive producer has like a hands on. He must be role. a very busy man. I don't know if he's reading all these scripts all the time. Um, well, he's quite discerning. I don't know if he'd yeah. want his name on something if it was just a big yeah. stinker, would he? And this isn't like, this isn't like you wouldn't stick your name on this because like, yeah, guaranteed guaranteed cash yeah, in my pocket because i don't think it did terribly well critics wise yeah i think because there's so many so much going on in it a lot of people sort of like didn't quite get on board with it yeah but i'd like i enjoyed it it was like it was worth a watch i really enjoyed it apart from the ending you know uh which kind of broke my suspension of disbelief a little bit i guess they broke my heart <laughs> <laughs> um apart from that like it's a it's the best example of a romantic sci-fi i think i've seen yeah mixing those genres properly like it is a it is a faithful version of a romantic drama and it's got interesting sci-fi concepts in it it's it sits in both of those camps quite yeah. nicely and it works on all those levels and sort of like in contrast to uncanny which has like the darker element of all these kind of issues yeah. which we're sort of like seeing with um robot and human relationships specifically romantic relationships it's nice to see the sort of like juxtaposition of these two yeah so in Uncanny and in Zoe, we're seeing more human-like depictions of AI again. And that leads us on to our next episode, where we're having sort of a special on TV shows. So specifically, we're looking at two different TV shows, which have um, had a couple of different incarnations. So the ones we're going to be looking at are Battlestar Galactica. Fantastic. I'm really looking forward to chatting about that. Me too. And we're also going to be talking a bit about Westworld. So both of these um, were initially put out in the 70s. So Westworld was a film in the 70s and Battlestar was a series in the 70s as well. So it's going to be interesting sort of like chatting about these and both of them have very strong female protagonists in them. So because those films uh, and TV shows 
have a lot of strong female characters mm. in them and interestingly an interesting intersection between the female characters and the feminist aspects with the AI aspects we're yeah. going to be getting an expert in because uh, we're out of our depth in those topics aren't we yeah we're ill-equipped <laughs> uh, so we'll be talking to Rihanna Dillon yep who will be joining us to discuss uh, yeah about Star Galactica and Westworld Very yeah it should for that. be really good it'd be nice to get a different perspective on the, both these shows and yeah so that will be our next episode so thank you very much for listening to today's podcast episode um, as always we are out there in the social media world um, you can find us on Twitter at Through Sci-Fi Pod uh, we're on Facebook we've got a Facebook page um, please like that we've only got a very few likes on that <laughs> one at the moment so um, if you're a Facebook user definitely check that one out um, we're on all the usual podcast sites as you know because you've downloaded the episode subscribe if you haven't already subscribed please and yeah review it please recommend it to a friend we really appreciate that thank you for listening